The brain of each and every one of you is composed of hundreds of billions of neurons, also called nerve cells, and hundreds of trillions of synapses through which electrical current flows between the neurons. In reaction to a stimulus from the outside, a wave of electrical activity traverses this network as the brain processes information. The hidden structure in this dynamic tapestry has only recently come to light thanks to the mathematical tools of algebraic topology, which is my mathematical field. During the next 15 minutes, I'm going to guide you on a mathematical mystery tour of our new vision of how the brain functions what its connection is to this constellation of points and lines and shapes in the image behind me, and how it accelerates the development of the new field of digital neuroscience, with important implications for our understanding of brain pathologies and for the creation of new drugs, to be able to test new drugs in a digital environment, and also for the amplification of artificial intelligence and machine learning, about which you've already heard a lot today. So the research I'm going to be talking to you about is actually related to the brain of a rat rather than the brain of a human. And you might think that that's sort of cheating because the brain of a rat is much smaller than that of a human, as we see here. But there are a lot of resemblances nevertheless. The structure of a brain of a rat is still complex. And despite its small size, it's the structure of its neocortex, that part of the brain that's responsible for higher functions, for sight, for hearing, for language in the case of humans, for cognition in general, is very similar between a rat and a human. So if we understand things about the structure of the brain of a rat, we will also have learned a lot about the structure of the brain of humans. So let's look more closely at the structure of a brain of a rat. Despite its small size, it weighs only two grams as opposed to 1.2 kilograms for the brain of a human. It is still composed of hundreds of millions of neurons connected by hundreds of billions of synapses. So if we're going to actually study this brain, and what we'd like to do really is to build some sort of digital model of it, some computer model, then it seems like we need a huge amount of data in order to go about modeling this. It's such a big data problem with capital letters big that it's really not manageable with our current tools. Not only that, even collecting the data itself is an impossible problem. There's too much data to collect. So what can we do? Well, because the brain is in fact highly structured, we don't need to make all the measurements in order to create this model. It's enough, in fact, just to make a few measurements well chosen and then to construct the model based on that, taking advantage of this degree, high degree of organization of the brain. So if we're going to talk about building a model of the brain, we need to talk about what the building blocks are. The building blocks of the brain, and therefore of the model for the brain that we're going to be talking about, are neurons. So, what is a neuron? A neuron is the basic processing unit of the brain. And they come in many flavors, both in terms of their shapes and in terms of their response to electrical stimulus, their electrical activity, because they communicate via electricity. Now, in the digital reconstruction I'm going to be talking about, which is built by the Blue Brain Project at the EPFL, they take as input data these neurons, and they're particularly interested in studying what's called the somatosensory cortex of the brain. So it's part of this neocortex. It's roughly here, we're talking about humans, and it has to do with the primary processing of sensory information, touch, sight, hearing, taste, and so on. So when these signals first arrive in the brain, that's where they're processed. And so we want, or the Blue Brain Project wanted to reconstruct this part of the brain. The input data for this reconstruction consisted of hundreds and thousands of care painstakingly obtained microscopy images of all kinds of different neurons that show up in the somatosensory cortex. There are in fact 55 different types based on shape. And so they took samples of the 55 different types, gathered the data in the laboratory, and used that as input. But we're going to talk not only about the structure of the brain, but also its function. It's active, because your, your brain is actually doing things, right? You hope so, anyway. And so 
you need to understand its activity. And for that, you need to know something about the electrical behavior of these neurons. So there were also very intricate, complex experiments carried out in laboratories to measure the electrical response of neurons to different stimuli. And that is also input data for this model. Given this input data, it was run through a supercomputer, which is based here in Ticino, actually, I think even in Lugano, the blue gene computer, which reconstructs the model. And so, we end up with a model that shows how all these neurons are connected. I have the luck to work with a fantastic visualization team at the Blue Brain Project, who created this image of a couple of neurons and how they're communicating to each other. So the sort of blobs you see are the somas, or cell bodies of the neurons, which are their prim primary processing units. The sort of tendrils you see are the axons and dendrites of the neurons, which are the sort of the communication wires. So signal flows through a neuron from its dendrites into the soma and then out through the axon. The sort of bright spots that you see, that are touch points between the axon of one neuron and the dendrite of the next, those are the synapses where you see electrical activity happening. Synapses act as sort of valves. Electricity flows in one direction through the synapse, from the axon of one neuron, called the presynaptic neuron, to the dendrite of the second neuron, called the postsynaptic neuron. So we need this basic lesson in neuroscience in order to understand the construction of the model and then how we're going to go about simplifying it afterwards. So, what we're going to do is figure out how to come up with some sort of geometric abstraction, abstract representation of this network of neurons. And it's this mathematical abstraction that we're going to be able to study, to quantify, to be able to say more about the structure of the brain and what the role of that structure is for the function of the brain. So in more detail, before we talk about those mathematical models, let's talk more about how the blue brain model of the brain is constructed. What the scientists do is they're looking at a, what you could think of as a sort of core sample of the somatosensory cortex. So this, you know, you sort of would imagine drilling down into the somatosensory cortex and you take out a little core sample that's only about two millimeters high and about half a millimeter in diameter. And this core sample, like an archaeological core sample, for example, has different layers. There are six different layers. And a lot is known about how many neurons of which type you will find in each layer and roughly where they should be. So the algorithm that they designed, that's run through the supercomputer here, positions different kinds of neurons in the different layers according to this biological rule of thumb. Not only that, since diversity is so important in nature in many ways, it's important to come up with diversity of shapes of the neurons, so the shapes that are extracted from microscopy are also tweaked a little bit, so that you get a wide palette of different shapes of neurons that go into this process. Then the final stage is to figure out where the neurons are connecting together. They have to be able to pass a signal from one to the other. We have to figure out where the synapses are. And so that's the next step in the process, which is actually a complicated four-step algorithm of which I will spare you the details today. So at the end of this anatomical process, one ends up with what we call the microcircuit. So it's a digital representation of this part of the somatosensory cortex with its six layers. 31,000 neurons connected by 37 million synapses. And we see these beautiful layers, and they have, we have different types of neurons there. There are the excitatory neurons, which are boosting the signal and getting the party more excited. And then you have the police neurons. Whoa, 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 whoa. The inhibitory neurons who show up at the party and say, turn down the volume, please. Because you have these both kind of neurons, because otherwise things would get kind of out of control. So we can make this simulation, or we can build this digital reconstruction. And this tells us about the structure of this part of the brain of the rat. But what we really care about is its function, how it becomes active. So for that, we need to integrate into this model physiological information, where it responds to electrical stimuli. And that's where this other experimental data comes in. And so what the modelers do is they include information about all the possible electrical reactions of different types of neurons to input stimuli. Even neurons of the same shape may have different electrical behaviors. Then they take into account the fact that synapses have come in many, many, many different flavors, and they build that into it as well. Once that has been built into the model, you actually have a circuit that can react to input stimuli. You can patch a bunch of these together and have a biologically remarkably accurate model of a piece of neural tissue.
in which you can perform experiments by inputting different kinds of stimuli. This is an example of what it looks like when you input stimuli to one of these virtual pieces of neural tissue. You see this the electrical activity that is spreading. You have this sort of beautiful tapestry of sort of random spiking that's going on. So these electrical discharges we see are called spikes by the neuroscientists. And you see this sort of wave of activity spreading across the network. And you'd really like to understand, it looks very random. You kind of wonder, well, how can we describe, how can we quantify, how can we characterize this behavior? When this beautiful wave of electricity sweeps across there, what exactly is going on? So for that, we need new mathematical tools. So if we look at this network of neurons, again, another beautiful visualization by the team at Blue Brain, you can say, well, what sort of mathematical structures are hidden in the thicket of connections in this neural network? Or through what sort of filter should one look in order to discern what's going on? And that's where my kind of mathematics, algebraic topology, is going to come into play. But before that, let's talk about what we need to think about, how we can abstract this representation of the circuit in order to even apply any kind of mathematics to it. So in order to get here today, if you're not from Lugano, you probably needed a map of Lugano in order to find the LAC. So that means that you're used to thinking about an abstract representation of a real complex object. If you look at a map of Lugano, it's telling you the essential information you need to know about Lugano in order to get from here to there. But it doesn't tell you everything about Lugano. We're going to do the same sort of abstract representation of this circuit of neurons in order to be able to reduce this problem to something we can actually study. So this is about connectivity. How are neurons connected together in how many ways? Because you could have sort of sequences of neurons that are all connected together by synapses, but you could have many different patterns, paths of synapses, that would get you from one to another. That's the sort of question we're interested in studying. So in order to do this, we're going to talk about the topologist version of the map of Lugano. We're going to represent a neuron just by a dot. So it's something zero-dimensional, a mathematician would say, a dot. Then, a connection between two neurons is going to be represented by something one-dimensional, a little line segment going from one to the other. And since, as I said, the synapses are unidirectional, they act like valves, electricity flows in one direction, we put a little arrow on the edge to indicate the flow information like this. So that's how we're going to be representing connections between neurons. But sometimes you're going to get a whole bunch of neurons that are working together, a family of neurons that are connected together. And they're forming what we call directed simplices. That's our fancy word for these sorts of especially important connectivity structures. So for in the case of the three neurons, the three dots that are represented there that are all connected, we're looking at a family of neurons that are all connected together in such a way that they're working together to, to force the flow of information from an input to an output that are labeled there a source and then a sink. In the case of the 3D object, then we have four different neurons that are all working together in a family to ensure the flow of information from the source to the sink. There's always, there's an unambiguous flow of information in one direction. And these can go even higher dimensions. We can even talk about four-dimensional things, which are a little hard to represent on a flat screen. But this is the idea, that we would have five neurons that were all working together to encourage the flow of information from source to sink. And what our experience has shown is that the higher the dimension of a simplex like this, the more highly coordinated the electrical behavior of the neurons is. This shows that it it really takes a team to work together towards the same target, and then you can really boost the signal. This has really come out very clearly in our experiments. So these are important things to study. Now, when you give a child a collection of blocks, we can think of these directed simplices as blocks, they're gonna take the blocks and build more complex structures, a castle, for example, from the blocks. The important features of the castle are going to be its windows, its rooms, its doors, and such. And similarly, when we look at the network of neurons, the directed simplices that we see in the network of neurons also build complex structures that have important features that look like windows and brooms and so on. So for example, from a bunch of one-dimensional simplices, you can build together something that looks like a window. If you think of that as a cavity in a more general language. We can also do this in higher dimensions. We can take 
what we call these two-dimensional simplices, each of which is built from three neurons, which you can think of as triangular blocks. If you ache, ache, take eight of these triangular blocks and you glue them together along the edges, you can build a nice box, which is hollow on the inside. So this is another notion of a cavity, and this works in higher and higher dimensions as well. Now remember, these dimensions are not sort of real in some sense. These are geometric representations of the structures in the neural network. So how many of these things are there in the network, the microcircuit that we built? And are there more than you would see in a random circuit? Turns out that the answer is yes. What this graph is showing us, if we look at the blue curve, it tells us the number of simplices of different dimensions that we find in the blue brain microcircuit. And we see that tens of millions of two dimensional and three dimensional simplices, millions of four dimensional simplices, and you can't see it on this graph, but there are actually lots of five, six, and seven dimensional simplices, which means you have up to eight neurons that are all working together to amplify the signal and to send it along. When we compare it to the green curve, for example, which is just a randomly connected network, we see it's much less complex. So that the biology is giving us complexity in this structure, which is important. We need that complexity in order to be for the brain to function properly. What we see here is what's actually going on with activity. We're measuring activity now. And the video that's turning on the left is showing us little snapshots of activity in the network. The line segments that you see are actually connections that are active during that particular snapshot, which gives us in each case for each of these snapshots a little subnetwork to analyze in the same way. What the curves are showing us is the reaction of the whole network to stimuli, to three different stimuli. And we see that what happens is there are one-dimensional structures that appear, and then as these one-dimensional structures these one-dimensional cavities, like windows, are starting to disappear. There are three-dimensional ones that come up. Then it reaches a sort of a culmination, at which point it collapses. So as the brain is processing information, it's creating sort of virtual sandcastles that are increasingly complex. And then all of a sudden, it arrives at the end of the information processing, and the whole thing washes away, like a wave washing a sandcastle off the beach. So what can we say about the future? of digital neuroscience. Algebraic topology has given us the tools to discern the hidden structure in the brain and in its function and understand how the shape of the structure shapes its function. So we need to push this further and see maybe what happens as we start learning in the brain. On the other hand, we can now, now that we know something about normal uh, function should look like, we can start to say, what is malfunction going to look like? How can we characterize a brain that's not functioning properly? So this should give us a tool to better understand brain pathologies. We can also, as I said, test drugs on here. And now that we've learned more about which structures in a network lead to better function, then we, maybe we, the people who are doing artificial intelligence and machine learning can use this knowledge to amplify their artificial neural networks. The future of digital neuroscience is bright, and I strongly encourage young people who love mathematics and who are passionate about the brain and want to be curious about how it functions to consider digital neuroscience as their profession for the future. Thank you very much.